when I got into IQ, I pretty much went in head over heels. And I studied with every teacher who came, and I went to every class I could find. And this was back when there were three dojos in the whole Bay Area. And um, in the midst of all the different teachers telling you different things about how the different techniques were done and hand positions and all of it, and, and a fairly overwhelming amount of data, um, I kind of started to try and figure out what it was I was doing there because I'm not really a martial artist. I don't get into fights. Um, I don't even really get into arguments. But I knew that there was something in this art that was very important to me. And uh, that's not a story, but, but I did find myself exposed to it. I've been looking for a martial art. When I saw it, I knew it was the one. And then when I went into, uh, we used to train actually in a church, in a room in a church. We didn't have a dojo. That was, there were two dojos, and there was our church practice session. <laughs> and um, the first time I went into the dojo, and the actual dojo was Alan Grove, was a, probably uh, Nadeau Sensei's second student to reach black belt. Excellent, excellent teacher. I walked in and uh, didn't even know enough to bow or anything. That's how different our, our world had been. There were some rights of those things there. And I had come out of yoga. I'd been studying and teaching yoga for some years at that point. And, uh, and when I saw the memoirs of the master that are in the back of um, the Nadai Doshu, Kisumaro Ushiba's book uh, the, uh, on Aikido, uh, they had printed it up, and it took me away. It just absolutely took me away. And when he said that the kanji I for harmony is synonymous with the kanji I for love, and that Aikido was the realization of love, and I, I had been having some difficulty with the idea of getting into a martial art because, like I said, I'm not a fighting person per se and, of course, had imagery in my head of what martial art without any knowledge. But I saw his words and it swallowed me whole. I got in uh, madly into it and I started to figure out, what am I doing here? So to begin our, our practice, let me put that question into the air to you. What are you doing here, here? with me today, uh, here in the Art of Aikido, here in the particular dojo you study in. But watch immediately how the energy starts to move into the head and the uh, neural synaptics start to try and figure it out. And then I want to emphasize that there's something going on in the rest of the body, but it usually gets lost. And this becomes particularly true when you get into a conversation, and the more heated that conversation is, the more that tends to happen. The head tends to take the energy. The muscle around the spine will tighten, actually, and the cerebral spinal fluid will be forced into the head, put in the brain under pressure. It's a little physiological here, but I think you can feel it. Or you'll recognize it in yourself when you're in one of those places, if you ever are conscious enough to see that you're losing it, and you'll say to somebody, or somebody has probably said to you, stop, wait, I just need a little space here. Or even in a relationship, that can happen as the pressure builds up. So I want to bring you back into the muscles around the spine. Look at constrict, tighten the muscles holding the spine, and you'll notice that you probably grab an area, thoracic, cer uh, cervical, or uh, lumbar area, probably the thoracic, but just notice where it is, and notice where you're not tight. See if you can't equalize the tight, and not real tight. All we need is just a little bit of pressure. See if you can equalize the tightening, so it's there from the top of the cervical vertebrae at the uh, base of the cranium, all the way down through the thoracic and then down into the lumbar. And don't worry about getting it precise. Just basically everything's feeling that tension and then release it. And continue to release it. And then 
is if you had like a heart with a bull's eye in the middle, uh, let's go from the 10 ring to the 9 ring to the 8 ring, as it were. Just keep moving closer and closer to the spine. Try and get the whole spine or pay attention to the whole spine so you eventually are able to release everything in the 8 ring all the way from the top to the bottom and then to the 7. And closer and closer in and soften those muscles and open. And feel what goes on in the rest of your body as that happens. Just notice whatever it is that happens for you. And it will depend, of course, on the state of attention, also the state of your being, and the physiological state of your body. The ring into the four ring, relaxing the muscles. And as we start to go to the last few steps here, I'd like you to notice that your, or let me guess, that your breath is probably changing just slightly. But like we don't listen to the body, we don't listen to the breath too often. But like, right now, let's pretend that it's very critical what your breath is telling you. Telling you how deep to breathe. It may be asking you to breathe deeper or less deep, shallower. It may be asking you to breathe faster or slower. It may be asking you to hold or release the breath. Moving to the center in the bullseye now, meaning the muscles immediately around the spine are releasing, and your breath is responding, and you're listening to that breath. And you're doing what that guidance is giving you, because that force that breathes you, that causes inspiration, is your connection with the divine force. Now, I was teaching in Switzerland with Patrick a few months back, and one of the guys said, well, I don't like the word divine, I'm atheist. So let's just say universal force. When you hear me say divine, if I should slip and say it again, the force that activates the universe, that has created the ecosystem that's given birth to you, that simple voice of the breath, if you'll call it that, is your immediate direct connection with it. Now, I am guess everyone's good at this. Sometimes when we haven't had a preliminary exercise of tightening and releasing the muscles near the spine, you can lose touch with it, but it's very easy to find it again. Simply don't breathe. Don't resist breathing. Don't force breathing. Just don't do anything with your breath. And watch your breath take you over. Watch this force that activates the breath begin to move your breathing. And then, as a really good Aikidoist would harmonize with their attacker's energy, harmonize with that energy that's activating your breath. Take yourself into a sense of non-resistance, a sense of listening, a sense of harmony. Last minute here, moment really, releasing the muscles closer into the spine, Letting the breath permeate through the whole body. And begin to notice what we call the internal breathing. You're usually conscious of the external breathing, which is the breath going in and out of the lungs. But once it goes into the lungs, it begins to permeate the blood, and then the blood carries it to the individual cells. And as the individual cells breathe, they'll feel a little sensation. I'll use my words, this might be different but it tends to glow a little bit or relax a little bit or open or feel a little more vital. So take a last 15 seconds here, listen to the breath, and listen to it as it goes into the cellular level of your being. And as I start to talk and I distract your attention, whenever you can remember, you can do the slightest now that you're good at it, little tightening of the muscles around the spine and then releasing them and bring your attention back into the experience. Or it's funny, what word do I use? Is it your awareness or is it your body? Or is it your awareness of your body? So the first principle in three easy lessons, and I would say the first principle 
of Aikido is a centered, grounded, flowing state of presence. And I translate that as feel where you are. Feeling where you are is the ability to focus awareness into attention. As a starting point, bring your attention into the physical body, which really we've been doing now for several minutes. And then expand this awareness into the whole of your life. Feeling where you are can be practiced in a number of different ways. Notice your balance. And as soon as you do, I'm going to guess, or within a moment, you'll start to find yourself making little corrections. Unless, of course, you were way off and made big corrections. But usually they're small enough you almost wouldn't notice them. And that's the subtlety of feeling and sensitivity as we tune into it. And you may notice that you want to lean back or fold the smallest amount. When I do this with people who have no experience, I usually have them stand and lean forward about three or four or five inches. Bring them back to center. Ask them what changes. And we usually get, I'm going to guess you would guess with me, but we usually get, oh, I, run. Oh, I felt my weight go down. I felt a little more open. I felt a little more vital. And after a moment or two, people start to say, oh, I noticed I started to breathe again, and I was holding my breath. And then I do it, have them move forward an inch. And you might, if you're sitting in your chair, probably not just lean forward an inch. Notice how your body changes its state of tension. Come back to center. And you'll notice you get the same reaction at a subtler level that you get if you went up six inches if you're way off balance. And then the breath starts to open and the energy starts to flow and there's a naturalness to who you are. There's a little less defensiveness. There's a little less fear. The more presence, meaning who you are, glows in the room. Now imagine going the teensiest possible amount forward that you can until as soon as you notice, oh, that's no longer center, that's forward. And usually for beginners, that's already an inch or something. But I'm guessing for most of you, it's going to be a centimeter, maybe half a centimeter. And your body will immediately say, oh, this is not center anymore. And I, I'm assuming I'm talking to people who have now been training for a little while. And when you still come back from even a millimeter, back to a more centered state, the same process begins to happen. So feeling where you are could start in this simple physiological zone. And then as you do it, start to feel in the body where you're relaxed, feel where the energy is flowing freely. Feel where it's not. And as you begin to bring your attention back into the body in that way, in the same way that you did it through balance, your body becomes more sensitive, your being becomes more sensitive, and the natural, autonomic, automatic corrections begin to happen. But that can't happen when you're not feeling where you are. And I've to use the term listening. Um, I'm going to tell you a short story here. I looked after my brother who was brain damaged. Uh, he was in a brain accident. He was in coma. He was in a coma for about four weeks, and that was in Minneapolis, out in the Bay Area. And I was getting a lot of people asking me, well, "Aren't you going to go back?" And I'm thinking, "Why would I go back? He's in a coma." One night. All of a sudden, about 10 o'clock, I get this message, go. And I was in a pair of shorts and a T-shirt. I had $180 to my name in a drawer somewhere. And Carol, my girlfriend, my wife at present, uh, lent me the money to buy a one-way ticket to Minneapolis. And um, I didn't have any clothes with me. I didn't know how I was going to get back. It was summer there, so I wasn't worried about the temperature. But And I went in the, and I woke Billy up. Um, anyhow, that whole story is called Healing with Key. It's in uh, Richard Hecker's book. Uh, I think it's in Quentin's book, and it's on the web at the Extraordinary Listening site as the book's called Healing with Key, if you want to hear more about it. But the reason I give you the background is because then I became responsible for taking care of my brother, managing the trust that look after him. There wasn't enough money really but if we were really careful with it, maybe we could make it last. And 
So I'm in a train station, Del Mar, California, just coincidentally, on my way down to see my mother having a conversation with my brain damaged brother, who is giving me a hard time about trying to, I'm trying to protect his money, and he's making it very hard for me. And I start getting upset with him, and I start getting frustrated, and I start getting angry. And then I couldn't really tell you what happened until a moment later could have been 15, but it probably was about 15 seconds. I see myself sitting in the Del Mar train station. Screaming. Into my cell phone. And what I want to point out there is I wasn't really feeling where I was at that moment. I had no sense. I wasn't paying attention. And that's how far off I could get. And that was at probably fourth dawn or fifth dawn, who knows. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But as soon as I saw it, because of my training, I saw all you back, I hung up the phone and I started my process. Within a moment, probably less than a minute, but a minute or two, I had done my practice. So I was back, connected, and present in my body. At that point, I was able to call my brother and say, look, I'm upset because I'm worried. I went on and had a decent conversation. But what I'm trying to share with you is that when you're, and this is, of course, the most extreme case, I think it makes it poignantly obvious, that when you're not feeling where you are, when you're not paying attention to the quality of your being, you can get incredibly far off before you start to correct. Now, there's a point physically where you're literally going to fall over, and most of us correct by that point. But if you can see how far away that is from the millimeter or two, and how much more subtle you the trick simply becomes remembering to feel where you are. Feel what's going on in your experience. Listen to the impulse to breathe. Bring something back into a state of presence. That's one last second of exercise here. Find yourself as centered as you would normally get as you sit at meditation or just get comfortable. And without moving your physical body at all, I want you to begin to think about leaning forward. Now, a lot of beginners don't get this, but I'm guessing most of you will have some sensation as you release that and just be present. Just thinking about moving forward and then not, not doing anything, just being present in the moment. So let's do it once more. Just think about leaning back. And you probably get a little, if you're subtle now, a little tension in the body, and as you come back to just being present in the moment, all that goes away. As a tense muscle cannot feel, a tense being cannot listen. And I, I like to make a distinction here. I have a little fun with it. That people talk about really being heard, you know, when you feel like you're really heard. Is that what you're talking about when you talk about listening? And I said, no. I understand what you're saying about when, when people do hear you, but I want to make a real distinction here because when I was a kid, there was a lot of stuff my parents said to me, and I heard them. I just didn't listen. So this quality of paying attention, of actually letting the information affect who you are as you listen to or feel where you are, who you are changes, and instead of again, from the extreme case of screaming into my cell phone, just being a little tense or a little harsh with your partner or your coworkers or who, friends, whoever, you start to be able to work much more in harmony and the same sense of ease that comes with your breath starts to show up in your relationships with your work, whether that's writing or designing or sailing, uh, Driving, it doesn't really matter. There's a shift that happens in your quality of being. And it's, to me, it's incredibly easy. All you have to do is feel what's going on for you. And I like to combine the word feel, listen. Meaning, receive the message and, and let it affect you or act on it or be a part of it. So, first easy lesson is feel where you are. Listen to the impulse to breathe. The lesson is easy. What's hard is to remember to do it. But 
is, I quote myself here, you can't get there from not here. And I go on about this, but if in your Aikido, you're not really present, uh, your technique loses power in inverse proportion to your degree of presence. So that would be my introduction to lesson number one. So I'm assuming we're good. I, I, like I say, I think the lesson is actually pretty easy. The hard part is remembering. Again, the, this book, uh, Aikido in Three Lessons, which I redid as Life in Three Lessons, so it's, it's available both ways, I believe. Yeah, up at the extraordinarylistening.com and just go to books and you can do a free download and you can get all this information. Uh, so in case you wanted to remind yourself or, or go a little deeper into it, the book is just arranged where it's very simple layout and then it takes each concept a little deeper. But feeling where you are includes feeling where you are mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Extend it into your relationship into the world. Feel where you are in space. Feel where you are in relationship to other people, other people's attitudes and emotions. It includes larger dimensions. Feeling where you are in your life. Feeling where you are in the creation. It's the focus of awareness into attention and loss to walk through a doorway and not into a wall. The power of focus of attention is equally important in our mental, emotional, and spiritual growth as it is in the physical realm when we move from one room to the next. I'll move into the second easy lesson, which is harmonious relationship. And all of us who have been in any kind of intimate or long-term relationship know how easy that is. We also know how hard it is. Harmonious relationship means an engaged non-resistance. It implies moving in confluence with your experience, except your feelings, the feelings of others. It means adapt change by aligning with the situation as it unfolds. When someone attacks in the practice of physical Aikido, don't resist the force. Don't stay on the line of attack and pose the energy. Be pushed by it or pushing back against it. Enter in beside and turn and face the attacker's direction and try to understand their view. That attack happens to be an emotional rush going on in your own system. Again, don't resist it. Grief, sadness, anger, happiness, joy. Surprisingly, people have difficulty with all of them. But if you can turn and face in the direction of the movement of your emotional quality and go with it, you find that if it's a difficult or negative emotion, it heals quicker. If it's a positive or reinforcing emotion, it becomes more powerful in your life. Harmonious relationship really describes entering into an inquiry. I, um, I was telling this story. I was just down teaching this and after, after I was with Patrick. And I said to the folks at the beginning, I said, if you've ever been in a movie and you walk out of the movie with a, whoever you're at the movie with, Thinking to yourself, that was the crummiest piece of crap I've ever seen. And you're just about to say, God, what a terrible. And whoever you're with says, God, wasn't that a good movie? And then I like to say, and what if she was really cute or he was really cute? Or what if it was your boss or your sensei? Or what do you do when you find yourself in a seemingly unharmonious place there? Do you argue? No, that was a bad movie. Think about it for a second, how you would respond. Because I believe that this whole process of Aikido, and certainly for me personally, I don't mean to interfere in anyone else's interest in the art, in any way they draw value, whether that be spiritual development or martial capability or just a more present, fluid, adaptable state of being. The practice of the art for me, what I think O Sensei was empowering us to do was to become authentic beings. And in that moment when you potentially in conflict with someone else's view of the world, how do you stay authentic? 
and yet be in harmony with the situation. So I think you can explore a harmonious relationship in a lot of ways. But I know a lot of people, my brother, being a film buff, would immediately tell me what an idiot I was if I didn't like a movie that he did like or did like a movie he didn't like. Um, but my sense is, at that point, how do you handle that situation? Do you abdicate your own state of being? You fade away from the attack, as it were, on the mat? Or do you go at them and try and change what they think because you're right? Like I say, everybody thinks what they think is right. Otherwise, they just think something else. So I come back to, at those moments, our step is still feel where you are. Watch what's going on in your system. Watch the tendency to feel like, oh, they're an idiot, or oh, I don't know anything about film, or what do I do now? Or, and as you start to get present, again, as soon as you come into that centered, balanced state, and that exists in every dimension, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and I'll call it universal or creational, your whole attitude in the world shifts. And so I would say at that point, you find yourself in a situation where in your interaction with them, you're now in a position to say to them, what did you like about it? You might learn something. They might know you aspects of something that you never saw before. But as soon as you get into the real reality, that can't happen. You reinforce a fixed identity. Stop your growth. That sin, shame of losing your presence, ending up out of harmony with what's unbelievable in the universe. There's something going on here that you could go and be part of. Now, as Miles mentioned, I'm a musician. Uh, it may be reaching a bit to call me a musician, but I, I love music and I love to play and write songs and play a number of instruments and I love playing with other people. And the whole essence of that process, they're listening to what's going on and playing in harmony with it. That doesn't mean that you don't play discordant notes or notes that increase the tension as well as resolve the tension. Both of those are correct. But the ability creates something that has a beauty. And beauty is a very personal word here. But you get to decide for yourself what beauty is in your life. Now, since we're not really working with ukase here, I would say, in the same way we have a physical balance, each of us a mother, each of us has a father, and as such, we're both a combination of yin and yang, masculine and feminine. And if you can feel in your own being, do you tend to be more towards the masculine side or do you tend to be more towards the feminine side? And I won't even stop to find those now. Wherever you're at with it is good enough. But if you'll notice that as soon as you feel, oh, you're a little forward or you're a little masculine or you're a little... Uh, receptive, you're just overly receptive, uh, far on the, on the feminine side. And start to bring that feeling in your own state in balance. Then you're in a position where, with your own self-confidence, you can say, what did you like about it? I thought this part was weak, but not, it was a good movie and you're wrong. Any more than if they, after you leave the movie, you go to the uh, ice cream store and and you order a vanilla ice cream cone, and they order a strawberry, and you go, no, no, strawberry's wrong. Vanilla's good. As stupid as that sounds, that's how stupid our judgments are in the artistic realm, and really in most of the life realm. Being able to stay in the inquiry. Feel where you are. Feel what you feel. Don't say you like the movie if you didn't like it, but still an openness to learning and growing. And out of that harmonious relationship, Universe. The natural creativity of who you are and what you are comes forth. 
you don't even have to do it per se. It's a natural outcome of presence and harmony. Creativity just unfolds. If you've ever been in a situation where you're so upset you can't find the words, you're almost st stuttering because you're so resistant to your own being. You can see that your creativity is completely impeded, but I, I like the picture of, you know, you have an old friend you haven't seen in years. You know, you're up till 3 in the morning, and the, the words just fall. It's just so great to see them. It just, you don't have to think of what you're going to say. It's just fun. It's, and that's the creativity. So that's my basic layout of the three easy lessons. I've shared with you the fundamentals of the, the principles that I developed, and I'll, I'll just leave it saying, because there isn't any Aikido technique that you're ever going to do that you don't want to be present for. And in my not-so-humble opinion, you never want to be out of harmony with your uke. You never want to be resistant to your uke. You always want to be in a harmonious relationship with their energy. And as I say, then out of that, a natural technique will, will flow. And for those of you who have never trained with me, Although all my students learned their techniques and their technicals as well as I would say as anybody else did, we spent most of our time in Giawaza because uh, obviously in a real situation, your attacker is not going to put the correct foot forward or attack you with the attack that you'd like to practice on. You have to deal with whatever comes up in the moment. And of course, more realistically, since I don't think most of us probably spend a lot of time fighting, we do face the challenges of everyday life, they're spontaneous, and we have to be able to respond in a spontaneous way. So that's why I like the Giawaza practice. Ben Miller, can you open up Mark Sherwood's mic? The idea that I've, I've been given before, that uh, it's not hard to remember. It's hard to remember to remember. And and I, I really, and so for me, I struggle with like these, these great sort of paradigm-shifting sort of ideas um, are there as a sort of a, I don't want to say a carrot, but they're there, and that, and that sometimes when I go to um, exercise a technique or, or blend with a partner or whatever, I find that whatever my intent in the moment is, it can, it can disappear really fast. So our, our conversation uh, quickly moved to what, what really drives the boat here, you know, and what can we really do about it, and we, we, we started moving between, you know, spirituality and Aikido and what are the relationships between the two, and uh, sort of asking the kind of questions that maybe aren't so easy to answer in a direct kind of way. It's almost like, you know, train, 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 and the answer will occur to you. Um, I was going to take notes today, and my pen stopped writing, and I just thought, oh, I'm just going to remember what everybody said, but that, of course, didn't happen. Um, I really appreciate um, what Richard's been sharing with us, uh, and engaged non-resistance seems like an incredible theme in and of itself. So I guess what I would just say as a question that, that maybe we can fill out is what are the what are some really good pointed kind of principles that are not quite so global? I love the global principles. I love the philosophy, and I love sort of swimming in this sort of spiritual Ike soup. But when it comes time to train, um, the answer might be, well, just train. You know, and and all the answers and all the not all the resistance will fall away as it will. But um, I'm looking for something really for myself. Why is it that I, in a given moment that I'm so distractible? I think I'm not the only one. Like, why is it that the environment so captures my attention that it's hard to keep an intention through all the way to the end to feel like this this settling into this deep sort of more still place. I didn't prepare or write down that question. It's probably an awful one, but that's what's floating for me now. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right, Daniel, you want to open up Jerry's mic? And, yeah. You're on, Jerry. Okay. Well, it's, it's kind of piggybacking on Mark's question a little bit and, and, and the fact that we, we do forget to, to use these things in our, in our daily lives, and, and that's obviously a form of resistance that we are somehow resistant to uh, to remembering in the moment uh, to use the principles that we've learned and so I, I guess my question is um, and can we this sounds like a Zen Cohen but I really know very little about Zen but it can is 
can we bring the principle of non-resistance to resistance? <laughs> is it possible that we is how do we how do we deal with our resistance? I guess is my is my real question and. and uh, because obviously that that's what the 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 obstacle is when we're when we're not remembering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think that what you're pointing to in, in your questions, if I'm hearing you, and again, correct me if I'm missing anything, is as I said, uh, you know, one of those cliches when I said three easy lessons. Someone said, "Well, you know, you mean simple, but they're not easy." And I thought, "No, it's completely easy to feel where you are. And as soon as you feel where you are, you can tell if you're too tight. You can tell if you're not here in the moment. You can tell if you're resistant to what's going on. You can tell if you're. I think the the word I would use generically is uncomfortable. Or if you do make some corrections, they generally make you feel more." comfortable, natural, authentic. Uh, pick your own words here and help me out if you'd like to. So to me, the exercise, the lessons are easy. But it's exactly what you're pointing to. How do you remember to do them? Back to me screaming in my cell phone in the train station. The issue that I have with it is it is training. But what is it? that you're training. So if you're training uh, to make the move correctly and get the person down, and you're tightening your body, and you're not listening to your own experience, that's what you've trained. You'll now get better at getting the person down, and you'll get worse at hearing yourself or hearing the universe speak to you or harmonizing, becoming one with the universe. So. But one of the guys in New Zealand said, well, what do you do with the fact that you, you know, you've got this desire to, to, to succeed, and so you want to throw them? And I'd say, no, the desire to succeed is exactly right. The question is, what would you really like to succeed at? Because I like to use this big word, proprioceptively, you learn to ride a bike. Somebody can tell you anything they could speak to you for a hundred years about riding a bike, but until you get on the bike and feel it, you can't learn to ride a bike. And no matter how much they speak to you, it might move you along a little quicker. It's still going to be a process of learning to ride the bike. But after you learn to ride the bike, you never think about it again. When you start to tip to the right, you turn your handlebars to the right, you never Say to yourself, oh my God, I'm tipping to the right. I go through a mental process about it. It's proprioceptive. Once you start to practice paying attention to your feeling, and right now while you're listening to me, notice any tension in your body. Don't do anything about it. Simply feel it. And I'm going to guess already you're starting to feel a certain release from resistance into flow. So it's bringing your attention into the moment. It's simply practicing bringing your attention into the moment. Now, you might write it on the back of your hand or something like that, uh, feel where you are or something like that next time you're in class. So while you're just about to apply your technique to someone, you come back and say, am I practicing getting them down? Or am I practicing being in harmony with myself? And then am I using them to increase the pressure on myself so I get better and better at feeling where I am. Because once you feel where you are, the correction takes place automatically. It's the matter of bringing your attention into the moment, crystallizing your awareness into attention in this time and space. And practicing that over and over again, it will become proprioceptive. We'll never overcome the four plus billion years of evolutionary modality of a uh, constrict uh, attack of fight and flight. The process will simply become, as O Sensei said, my students think I don't lose my center, but that's not true. I, however, recognize it sooner, and I get back quicker. So making sure that you're practicing what you would like to develop, to develop is the essence of our work here. And uh, in addition to the Extraordinary Listening site, we have a channel 
on YouTube. I think if you just type in Moon Sensei, it takes to the channel. And on it, there is an exercise called the Extraordinary Listening Breath. And it's a, whatever it is, three minute, four minute video that reminds you, but it starts off with the words, after 50 years of awareness studies, martial arts, yoga, meditation, music, dance, if I had to do one simple exercise, if I could only tell you one thing to do, it would be listen to the impulse to breathe. I'm wondering how we're doing. I'm wondering if there's if this is helpful or your question has changed in some way or if we're in a place now where um, you're feeling like you're able to take something that you can practice because whatever you practice, you will get better at. And the more conscious you are about achieving you'd like through your practice. And for me, it was always that state of open creativity because as Miles pointed out, I'm a musician. My real interest was never in fighting. Uh, my interest was always in the creative improvisation uh, that a guitarist would naturally seek. So, uh, other people may be seeking different things in the art, but I believe if you're listening to your system in response to it, uh, I think there's actually a quote of O Sensei. The second part is when you call out the name of the divine, it echoes inside of you. When you call out the name of the divine, it echoes inside of you. As you tune your attention to that, which is your bestowed mission. That's not a thought. Don't go into your head. Go back to the body and listening to the breath. Let that manifest your bestowed mission on earth. As you call out the name of the divine, it echoes inside you. As you listen to your bestowed mission, you become manifester of that mission little law he maybe he wanted meat and potatoes the meat and potatoes is listen to the impulse to breathe and if you can't hear it just stop breathing for a minute and you'll watch it take over and as it takes over if you watch the breath process at first if you're having trouble breathing this impulse to breathe is almost like something that's attacking you it's it bugs you it's annoying almost and then after a while you you start to recognize that it's talking to you, and as you listen to it, and you come into harmony with it, that kind of a much more friendly relationship. You start to recognize that you can work with it. And if you go just a little bit further, you'll find out that who and what you are is that energy that is breathing you. And it may be a little heady as we talk about it, but as you stay with your breath, your identity will shift until you become less and less you and your little problems, you and your little attitude, and you become more and more a universal flow. And it doesn't mean you don't have your little problems. And it doesn't mean they aren't problems. It means that your ability to respond to them is infinitely more creative. Great. Maybe we will open up and maybe uh, check with Mark and or Jerry to see if there's any follow-up question and also open it up to everybody else on the call um, to see if you have uh, if something arose for you and if you have any anything to to add to the mix or to throw into the soup as Richard says all right let's go with Mark first and then we'll go back to Jerry hey Mark well I only quote lifted my hand because I wasn't I, my, my mic wasn't on, so I just want to say thank you for an excellent answer. I don't have any more questions right now. I thought that was a really uh, good way to, to frame the issue um, in an evolutionary light. Thank you. Thank you. Great, and uh, thanks, Mark. I'm going to go over to Jerry. Hang on just a second, Jerry. Okay, your mic should be up now. Yeah, I, I thought that was a great explanation, too. Uh, my only question was uh, the, the YouTube video you mentioned, is that, uh, is that the one called Breathing Techniques in Aikido? No, it's called The Extraordinary Listening Breath. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. I really, that was very helpful. Good. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah, I think the 
trick is, if, if we want to call it that, I, I like to say I'm into cheap tricks, meaning things that are really simple and easy, but actually are effective. Uh, bringing your attention to the moment, and there's nothing more powerful than the breath to connect you with the divine or the universe. And um, as you resonate with it, you realize there's no way you exist separate from the universe. There's no way you take yourself out of the universe or vice versa. But we can abstract as we move into our heads, and that's why I use the feeling rather than listening as a first baseline for coming into the body because uh, it is the unification of body, mind, mind uh, that is the essence of Aikido. It's what I call standing on the floor. Fraser used some different descriptions of it. For me, this essential practice of Aikido is being in both places at the same time mind and body, feeling and thought, um, your experience and your energy or experience, and unifying those. But I think the simplest practice and the essential practice is this connection with, call it the force that activates the breath, and I would, again, just between us, call it the divine. That union with the divine, everything emanates out of that. And... Uh, it is simply doing it until it's a proprioceptive process because once you do, then like O-sensei, it's not that you don't get off, but... You recognize it sooner and get back quicker. That's your all advanced enough to recognize how it is. When you try and do a, a technique when you're off balance. And the same thing will be true in the emotional and verbal realms. Uh, you speak more clearly, you think more clearly, your solutions are more creative and perspective of uh, existence. So I'm basically, thinking, we've touched on the main principles. The trick, of course, and as such, I think, uh, take a look at the books, take a look at some of the videos, and anything else you can do to help yourself do it, uh, just tell people, you know, uh, okay, just Tag something onto your computer seat in the corner of the screen, you know, or, or even paste a pasty on there that reminds you of the one you want to work on right now, or all three, you know, presence, harmony, creativity. Uh, breathe. Something simple. It doesn't matter. Because once you start the process, the universe will take over and teach you IQ. I don't know if you know the story, but Otsensa said that Becky Kahn used to wake him up at night and take him out in the garden and teach him IQ. I don't think he was looking at ghosts or anything. I think when he said the Aikikami, the divine spirit of harmony would resonate in his being, he would go out and experiment with these techniques. He would accomplish his bestowed mission by listening to that divine voice. And um, and if divine is a funny word, then I just go back to the immortality, the spirit. And the more you can do it, the more you'll emanate it, the more, uh, just like if you hit the D string on one violin, the D string on every other violin in the room will resonate. If you come in tense, if you come in angry, if you let yourself indulge your negative emotions, you're going to encourage that in the people around you, your children, your workers, your your friends even. But the more you're listening to your breath, and I know as soon as you do it, there's a softening in the body, there's a greater degree of ability to listen and understand others, there's a greater harmony, and we reconcile the world and recognize that we are one family. And I think on that um, note, I'm in, but I'm happy to serve you all in any way. That's great, Richard. Yeah, big amen on that note. It was really, really cool. And, and what I'm taking away from what you just said is that, you know, like you said, the D strings, one D string resonates another D string. And, uh, and O Sensei's divine call to get up and practice Aikido in the middle of the night. So what I'm hearing is that whenever we, ha whenever that inspiration is arising in us, we're obligated to say yes in one way or another and to allow it to, to flow out. Here's what I'd ask, and I'd love to hear one or two, probably no more than four sentences, from each of you would be willing to share something, and if you don't have anything to say, you don't feel like it, please don't feel any obligation. But 
Okay, Robert, your mic's open. Oh, I, I, you know, what's neat is, you know, one of my main, Zen is my main practice now, and this is all the stuff we do in Zen, too. You know, being open to everything, connecting to it with love, you know, from your center. It's, you know, it's just kind of the secret to everything in life. So that's, it was nice to have that emphasized again, reminded again. And Betsy has her hand up. Betsy and Kelly. So we'll start with Betsy, and then we'll get to Kelly. Hi, Miles. Hi, everybody. Um, I just I just wanted to give you the feedback that I really love what you said. I just, you know, I just love this direction, and I'm so happy that I was introduced to this. And my only problem is if people say to me, you know, well, I hate that creative stuff, and... And I think I just have to say, well, I, I don't know what to say, <laughs> but I just, I really love it. So I just want to say thank you. Well, if they hate it, then my wish for them is that they would follow whatever their bliss is. Yeah. And, uh, and I hope that you will continue to follow yours. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, beautiful. And thank you for that one, Richard. It's, uh, may we all follow our bliss. And uh, Daniela, if you could open up, yeah, if you could open up Kelly's mic. In where I practice, in my dojo, it's fantastic. Um, all aspects of the keto are cultivated and welcomed, and I feel really nourished. Um, but in the broader uh, region that I practice in, um, the the message that I get is I'm maybe a little bit of an anomaly that being so new to Aikido, I'm interested in the uh, other aspects off the mat when I'm third queue going on second queue and, you know, I still have so much to work on technically and um, that, that all this stuff, the philosophical, the spiritual, comes later and you need to be patient and put all your years in first. And um, I, I'm not willing to do that because I'm, I'm getting on an age, and so I'm just um, deciding what I'm going to do, and that's why I'm there. So, um, and I feel, like I said, really nourished in my own dojo. But I just wondered about the, the exploring this early in your Aikido, and I wondered if you, you could comment on that, if there's, if there's reason to wait or if it's okay to be plunging in. It's, it's a charming question in the sense that, um, you know, we are all interconnected and, and we do affect each other so much. But the most important thing, and this is just, how do we say, in my opinion, this is just what I believe, I couldn't prove it in court, is um, for you, is it Kelly? Yes to manifest Kelly. If you would bring who you are, you know, the saxophone is going to be playing a different part. You just play your French horn. Don't play the part the saxophone is playing. Play the French horn part. Don't play Ernie or Bobby or Jerry or Mary or Kelly. Kelly. If Kelly is interested Kelly in spiritual spirit development, development, don't let anything vary from your course. It's all your bliss. All your bliss. And I believe that that's not only what O-Sensei was trying to empower us to do, but I think he knew that if everybody would do that, we would be a beautiful symphony. And the people who are telling you what you should do probably are not quite in harmony with doing what they should do in the authentic way. They're operating from some idea of what they should do, and they're projecting that out into the world because you're not comfortable unless you're truly yourself. That doesn't mean you have to tell everybody you think they're an idiot just because you think they are. It just means that you're able to stay true to what's important for you. And I started, and as I said, um, nobody else did Giawaza. I could give you a long story about how it all came about, but for years and years, I had people giving me uh, that kind of mentality. You know, you can't, you know, you've got to learn all the techniques first. 
you got to be third don or sixth don before you can ever do Giawaza. And uh, eventually, of course, I did become that, and, and the high rank, unless people said anything to me. But my sense is I don't have any problem if all you ever want to practice is classical technique, or if you want to practice karate, or play basketball. Your business. But you can tell me why you think it's important to you, but please don't tell me who I am and what I should be doing. Don't tell me when I'm crying because my dog died not to be sad. Don't tell me when you treat me respectfully not to be angry. Don't tell me who to be. And I'm not interested in telling you not to tell me. I'm just saying to you, Kelly, you feel what you feel, manifest it. Bear who you are. And whether you like it or not, just be honest and authentic with yourself. And if they're not open to listening, go talk with someone else. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Now, the the yeah. E. Cummings has a great quote. But to be yourself in a world where everyone and everything is doing everything they can to make you be anything else is the greatest battle anyone can ever fight. And never give up. Now, a little more uh, fighting than our harmonious approach, but I just say, let Kami speak through you. Be authentic. Don't worry about the fact that people don't like what you like. You know, in, in Japan, they're saying if a nail sticks out, hammer it down. If somebody was left handed, they would teach you to be right handed. I don't think that's, that's the part of the Japanese culture that I look at and I go, you know, uh, there's a story in yoga of the swan. And it, the story is if you put a quart of cream and a quart of water into a bowl and put it in front of a swan, when the swan's done drinking, there'll be a quart of water left. Take what's important for you, Kelly. Live your life and help other people become authentically who they are. And I believe we'll have a beautiful world. If people are in contrast or fighting out of harmony or in resistance to their natural being, we're going to, you know, we're going to lose the gifts that they bring us. And I hope that you'll bring us the gifts. Thank you. Are we there, folks? We there? Is there anything you want to touch on? It seems like we're there, Richard. Richard. Thank you much uh, for spending this time with me. Really enjoy absolutely. being with you and, yeah. and uh, hope it brings value. And I hope you contribute that value to the people in your lives.